Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming in and giving up your Saturday to be here with us today. Um, we're going to make a little start. I hope lunch was great. And uh, usually at university, we used to refer to this as the graveyard slot because it was after lunch and everyone starts dozing off. But hopefully, we'll keep it nice and interactive. So just a little bit of a start. Let's, uh, let's see what we've got going on here. Okay. So we're going to be talking about the next five years. As many of you might be aware, the document from the GDC, which underpins the curricula at each of our dental schools, was called the first five years. So the next five years is looking at the time after that and where we're going. I have had some emails and uh, contact wondering if it's the next five years of NHS dentistry. And we may touch on that a little bit, but it's really your options, your life and your career, where you're going to be going in the next five years. And hopefully some of my advice might come in handy. Uh, there's a very cheesy photo of me, and uh, there's a... Uh, my name. There we go. So I did BDS, like most of you here, um, here in the UK. I was at Bristol University. Um, from there, I went on to the Royal College of Surgeons and did my MJDF examination there. After that, we, I moved on to MaxFax. So I did a SHO post and then moved on after doing a period of sort of part-time jobs within uh, MaxFax onto sort of staff grade sort of supervising as well. Um, I did VT in London, even though I trained in Bristol. So there was definitely a, a change coming back to London. And then I've been an associate for about four years as well. So a lot of that's been overlapping. Uh, to keep myself sane, but still involved in dentistry, I was Bristol president and I was BDSA president as well. So we had the conference in Bristol. And since then, I've been working with the Young Dentist Committee, our local BDA branch, and the LDC. For those, I remember all these acronyms when I first started, and I didn't have a clue what any of them meant. So obviously, the BDA is our trade union, and there are they represent us. The LDC is limited to NHS practitioners, so that's more in negotiations with your PCTs or whatever they may be called in your local area now. So it's important to get in touch with these people and keep in touch with them because it's fantastic for career progression, networking and understanding more about what's going on. So let's uh, move on. So at the end of the lecture, we've got three main points to kind of cover, but I think we'll hopefully cover a lot of other stuff that you'll find useful as well. We've got uh, the ability to assess and reflect on your own capabilities and limitations. I think a lot in dentistry we're told about things we can't do and shouldn't do, but I think we should also remember that we're part of, part of the top 1%, you know, in theory, coming into dental school and so on, and you all have so much to offer to the rest of society outside of your dentistry. So remember of all your capabilities, as well as knowing what you shouldn't necessarily be stretching to do. Um, understand better different uh, professional working and contractual agreements. So that's more to do with associate contracts. We'll touch on that a little bit. Um, and understand your role as a mentor and a uh, role model. So initially, this was to be within the dental team. But like I said, the wider society, I think that's important to be a role model as well. So to start off with, I came and nabbed two people during lunch. And I asked them to draw that picture. Question is, let's have a show of hands. How many people would trust the first person with their drawing if they were to do work on your teeth? Someone's probably smiling to themselves. Good. And then the second one as well? A little bit less. OK, there's going to be a rivalry between the two people. <laughs> right. And how about now? The first one? Maybe not so much. And then the last one? Not so much. Now, they were the same two people, but what happened was we ch asked them to do it with their right hand and then their left hand. So you've got to remember to be adaptable. Um, I'm left-handed, so at dental school, everything was set up universal. You could change things around. Uh, I went through the London Deanery. I was assigned a post, turned up, my room. It's a right-handed chair. So I spent most of VT retraining as a right-hander. So luckily, I was ambidextrous, so that kind of helped and I was able to. But you've got to be able to think about different circumstances. And even when I was doing my Max Fax post, there are things that were taught at dental school but there'll be other things and skills that you pick up along the way. So always be open to new concepts and new ideas. Now, with any signposts that tell you lots of things, they can also be quite confusing. So we've got NHS practice, all these different routes we could go down. There's other ones that we can go for. And sometimes people don't want to do any of them. Uh, there was a guy a year above me at Bristol, a good friend of mine, uh, top of his year all the way through, did fantastically well clinically, academically, started doing dentistry and realized, well, actually, he didn't really enjoy it, and he's retrained as an accountant. So, there are other routes as well. Uh, I'm not sure if accountancy was for me, so, so I'm not sure if most people go for that, but still. So most of us go into general practice. There's about 26,000 GDPs. Most people are self-employed. There's no defined career structure, which is one of the things that, as a young dentist now, I think it's important as, to be a general practitioner. We need to have some sort of structure, some sort of pathway to go down. Um, but some people follow the route of the uh, 
uh, faculty of um, general practitioners. There's others who go into postgraduate education, and this is kind of where people sort of creep towards uh, specialist practice. Where do you find work for general practice? The main things are BDJ, other publications, locum agencies, word of mouth and networking. So the LDC and the BDA uh, branch and sections are good places to meet people in your local area or go to the areas that you want to maybe work in and find out more about how things are there. Moving on, private practice. That's one of the aspects of general practice. Different people look at it in different ways. <laughs> so, um, so, and but most of us are doing predominantly NHS practice. And in, you've got to be very diplomatic. So in many ways, when you look at it, there's a lot of challenges that come through, a lot of discussions that you've got to have, and you've got to find a way. Every patient is different, and that's the one thing which I probably learned working at different practices along the way. Now, this is the GDC Register of Dentists. Uh, we see the numbers increased as to the number of dentists registered with them. Uh, this is courtesy of the BDA. The number of performers, so most of us in this room, has been increasing, providers going down. So whether they're doing less work, whether people are retiring, whether more dentists are coming in, and you can kind of see the pattern there. What has that meant? Well, this is the average associate taxable income. And for, let's say most of us work in England, I imagine. Used to be about three years ago or so, or so uh, six, just under 68,000. The average has gone down to around 63,000, which is quite a big difference in over a three year period. So things are changing and we need to evolve with that. So we've got to be aware of where things are going. Um, what I've also done is I've spoken to other people and got some sort of vox pops about what people think and so on. So uh, we've got general practice. Someone said to us, well, every young dentist should experience it. It's fantastic. And this is after your VT or FD1 because you, you look at all the wide scope of different fields in dentistry, you perfect your skills, and you decide where you want to go. And you meet all sorts. So I'm quoting here the, 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 lo the lovely and the crazy. But um, it's fantastic to see the wide range that we do see in general practice. Others say, well, what are the things that they don't enjoy? Others have turned, us, uh, turned to us and said, well, the red tape and the associate's position within the NHS. Providers have a different position in regard to the PCTs and so on. Lots of challenges and sacrifices you have to make um, to do the right thing because the system sometimes may be challenging to let you provide what you want, want to do for the patient. Associate contracts. So, interestingly, when we were coming to the end of dental school, we were told, well, when you're doing, going into work and you should sign a contract, and we're like, yes, we will, of course we will. But all of us are sometimes confronted with that situation. I was at one of the practices I worked at where the principal was like, Mike, we don't need a contract, it'll be fine. You know me, I know you, everything will be fine. It wasn't. So, so basically, you've got to make sure, no matter how nice anyone is, you've got to make sure that you have everything written down as best as you can. One of the best things to do is, rather than just get the contract and read it through and say, yeah, it sounds relatively kosher to me, it's fine. Try the BDA contract checking service. Um, it's important for you guys to be members of the BDA. I, I would recommend it. There are other associations as well, but that, that's a fantastic uh, service that they provide. And they'll kind of just let you know that some of the things might be in your favor, so which you may not want to necessarily discuss more with your principal. Other things maybe you do want to discuss because you might be missing out in some ways. Now, the NHS contract, uh, this is on the border, actually. I don't know which town it is, but half the road goes up to Scotland and half the road goes down to England. Um, and obviously, we know in different areas, it's different situations. So there's more like the item of service in Scotland, in the devolved nations, it's slightly different. And there are changes that are going through. If you keep up to date with what's happening perhaps in Northern Ireland, there's lots of changes happening to the service that's providing there. In England, we still call it the new contract, even though it's been a few years now, and there's a new, new contract on, on the way as well. So we'll be touching on that, but I think I'd rather let you guys ask me questions rather than me kind of tell you more about that necessarily. Um, move on to community dentistry, which a lot of us see as, as important to be caring professionals, and this is one of the aspects where people do work very, very hard in challenging circumstances. The salaried service is about uh, 1,700 dentists working there. Some come through their vocational training posts. Advertising is quite similar, but also look at things like community dental health for posts. You should also contact your local clinical director for the services and see if there's any posts coming up. The roles kind of go from dental officer upwards. And one thing I'm going to cover in these is trying to talk about the, the pay structure as well, because I think, I think at the moment, in the current climate economically, 
you've got to factor these things in. Unfortunately, I wish we could just do all the dentistry we want to do and not have to worry about the money side, but I want you to be as informed as you can be. Okay? So on average, the dental officers pay there, the senior dental officer after a little while, um, specialist services that come in, and the clinical director as well. You can see it's not horrendous, but you can see that the difference from dental officer to clinical director, there's a certain amount. In general practice, perhaps you get a wider spread of that. Um, spoke to a friend and said, well, what's it been like working in community dentistry? Because I haven't worked in community dentistry. And they said, well, there's the different clinics, there's all the different uh, cha challenging situations that you come across. Um, but what are the best bits? Well, you get lots of support from experienced colleagues, um, well-trained nurses, and on the whole, it's a relaxed and friendly working atmosphere. I can tell you I've worked in practices in London um, where it's literally almost feels like the treadmill. Patients coming in back to back, back to back, and it's very hard. Um, so in an environment where you can kind of develop your skills and not be worried about just providing a service, it's fantastic to be able to do that. Moving on, hospital dentistry. I'm not sure this is actually how they train, but <laughs> nonetheless. Um, uh, resources similar, BDJ, BMJ. The posts are very variable depending on what aspect you want to go into. So it's important to find out which area you want to go into and then which hospital and, and go that way. So through the deaneries and so on as well. But most applications are quite standard. There's a model contract, there's job descriptions and you go through there. Um, a service that a few friends have recommended as well is the National Advice Centre for Postgraduate Dental Education. It's based at the Royal College here in London. Uh, so it's a, a good resource as well. If I'm going too fast or anything, just let me know. Okay? If you can't hear me, just let me know as well. So in hospital, most of us start off as an SHO, um, FD1, FD2 or so, if, that, if that's what it's going to be called now. Um, moving through the ranks, you can see that going up to registrar, speciality doctor, and then uh, the consultant post. The, the variance is to do with on-calls. So the SHO job I did, for one part of it, there was obviously no on-call, so the pay was, was less than that. Um, but in some ways, it was quite nice to be able to go home at five and not worry about uh, nights. So. Hospital dentistry, well, a lot of people find that it's actually a nice progression from dental school because it's an environment that you might be used to. So you've got CV building, you can be part of studies and so on, and that helps you know, provide more, bows, you know, more strings to your bow and, and a chance when you want to apply for other posts and specialise that that's fantastic to have that with you. Um, hospitals offer a great opportunity to go to conferences, present posters, and you can see just help in studying generally. Right, Max Fax. Um, any Bristol graduates here? We've got a few. Uh, if I say the name Chris Bell, does that ring a bell? No pun intended there. So our nickname for him was Superman. He's, he's an oral surgery consultant. And, um, you know, Max Fax is something quite special. I mean, having seen some of these consultants, the way they work, it's incredible. Um, and it's slightly different to some of the other specialties as well. So we asked a few of our friends who've done going into medicine and going down that route. Some said, well, they just didn't want to have 40 years in, in practice and always enjoyed surgery. Um, one chap, he was saying, well, the route he took was to go through SHO posts, the MFDS or MJDF exam, and then build on that. Um, but also now there's the UK CAT and GAMSAT exams that you might have to consider as well. So make sure you get as much research as you can. And that's sometimes specific to the medical school you might want to apply to. So if some of you, uh, some of you came to me yesterday at the careers day and said, well, you know, I'm thinking of going into Max Fax. See the SHO jobs, see how it develops, but get as much information as you can. Because when you're in the hub, when you're in the hospital, you can find out everyone's different experiences. Because it even varies within London. So um, what are the worst bits? Obviously, one of our colleagues quite likes their lunch. Um, and the other thing is financially. So you've got to bear in mind that you're still going to be working hard. There are, being a, doing it the way around where you're a dentist first actually works quite well because you can do other posts, whereas if you've done uh, medicine and then going to dentistry, it's a little bit more challenging from the colleagues I've come across who did MaxFax. So academia. And many see it as a route to getting over some of the challenges that we find uh, with our career choices. And with academia, why do I go into it? What is it like? So some of our colleagues said to us, well, without the academics, there will be no dental profession. It's absolutely true. I sit on a committee, which is CC DAS, which is dental academics. And there's huge issues about people coming up to retirement and there aren't young, young dentists coming through into academia. And some of them because of the pay and various other reasons. Um, 
But you've got to remember, if the next generation of dentists that are going to come through are going to need to be trained. And I'm sure we'd all want them to be trained very well. So if you feel you've got an ability to teach and you think you'd enjoy it, you like things like research and so on, then, then maybe this might be a good route to, to go down as well. And you get to see a mix. So always new and innovative stuff coming through at the hospitals and as acad academic. And you can really shape someone's future that way. So speciality specific, institution specific, um, general training, you kind of have a clinical teacher or an academic clinical fellow and you progress up the ladder up to sort of con honorary consultant or a senior lecturer. Pay, for the junior positions it's variable, but as a lecturer you're looking between 30 to 57 and a senior lecturer between 49 to about 70 or so. So does anyone recognize that crest? What is it? Very good. Very good. We should give her a prize. I haven't got a prize to give you. Maybe the iPad at the end. We'll see. <laughs> That's there we go. So Armed Forces Dentistry, um, they've got a huge patient base. You know, you've got 160 service personnel, 178 uh, dental centers, and their dependents of wives, uh, uh, children, etc., and so on. Um, so each officer, and one of my friends is based out in Germany at the moment, sees about sort of, they've got about 1,000 uh, patients on their books. And you've got to contact the relevant uh, aspect, whether it's the Army, RAF, or Navy branch. With the handout that will be at the end, because I haven't provided it uh, to you guys, there'll be a little list of all these contacts as well. So we'll need to download that, so I'll give you the details at the end. But it's got the details of the different branches that you can contact and go from there. The commission ranges from about three to seven years. Um, some people have started as cadetships beforehand. So those up to nine terms, but I think you're, you're kind of locked in for seven years afterwards. Foundation trainee, fee, when you look at it compared to some of the VT salaries and so on, it seems quite nice. The next level, and then increases with rank as well. But the lifestyle is very different. You know, there's uh, my friend Christoph who's out there. Any of the Bristol people might recognize him, Christoph Harper. Um, his life is based in Germany, and some of the guys went off to Afghanistan, and he was literally on the base by himself for, for a long period of time. So you've got to be very flexible with your lifestyle as well. Right. Why go into it? Move jobs to a group of patients that really wanted our help, our soldiers. A uh, group of patients that deserve the best possible care, and I want to do the best dentistry I can. Be aware of opportunities. Now, this is important because whatever field you go into, you've got to still keep your ear to the ground and know about the other aspects of dentistry that you might be interested in. Um, and here, it's, it's fantastic advice um, from, from Verity, uh, a dentist. She's based in Germany as well. Um, so beware of your, be aware of your opportunities. Being a dentist opens your doors to many, with work, working abroad, hospitals, prisons, etc. Um, experiencing lots of different areas will make you a more rounded person and a better dentist. And I would second that wholeheartedly. So I think we all know where that is. And the session I was chairing yesterday, we were talking about working abroad. And some of the slides there made me think I should be out there, maybe. But um, overseas dentistry. So whether it's Australia, or you want to go to Kazakhstan, or somewhere else, or wherever in the world, um, you've got to know what the situation is and why you want to go there. Okay. So talk about Australia first. Because before we thought it was quite easy to, to go across, because it's recognized, and we have a good time, and it'll be fantastic, and we speak the language, and it's great. However, things might be starting to change a little bit, and this is why it's important. So this is the ADA, which is the Australian Dental Association, um, and they were saying about workforce shortages, which is kind of the reason why they wanted us in in the first place. Um, are these a myth? They're saying that since 2009, the workforce has increased by um, an increase of 27%. So it's starting to go up, and the last contact I had, because pre preparing for this, I was in touch with them, um, they said it's Dentistry has moved to the flagged list of professions. So professions where they're thinking, well, actually, we're filling up all the jobs that we want to fill up. In rural areas, I'm sure there's still positions, but I think in other places, it's going to be a bit challenging. So make sure you get as much information as you can. You've got to have a little checklist, and this will be on the handout as well. But um, if you're wanting to work abroad, you've got to look at immigration issues. Firstly, can you even go to that country? Can you work there? Can you get a work visa? What are the circumstances? Registration, that's your dental registration. So it's fine to be able to go there, but can you work there? Um, and then you've got to look at your employment options. Do you want to be through some of the agencies and maybe get a post here, have it all sewn up, and, or do you want to go out there and look for posts while you're there? Uh, one of the speakers yesterday at the Careers Day said to us, he went out there and he moved to Sydney and thought, I'll, I'll find a job. And he was there for a little while looking, and none of the private practices wanted to hire him because he had a six-month working holiday visa, and they probably didn't want someone just coming in, doing work and going. They wanted someone who'll stay there for a couple of years. So you've got to think about the market you're applying to. What are they looking for as well? And finally, if you want to do voluntary work, so if you're not looking to, get to do paid work, you've got to make sure that you've got everything in, in order to be able to do that. So there we go. 
Now, your next five years, I've kind of put this together. It's meant to look like number five. I'm not sure if it does. But uh, we've got, these are, I think, key things that you should bear in mind. Okay? And I'll say in a minute why. But social and activities, um, uh, location, professional achievements, personal life, and financial achievements. And why is that? Well, for, let's start with location. Where do you want to live? So whatever decision you make, you've got to then work out how easy it is to be where you want to be. Dentistry, we're being told more and more, isn't a job where you can go in and say, I want to work in this area. For example, you know a lot of people apply to London to come back and look for associate posts and so on. Um, you have to sometimes go where the work is. Um, so you've got to bear that in mind, depending which routes you want to go down into. Social and activities, just keeping you balanced, keeping you sane, because I think the danger with dentistry is it's kind of all-encompassing and sometimes you get more and more sucked into it. So you've got to make sure you keep a social life going, seeing friends, have activities and so on. Um, professional achievements, what degree to go for with postgraduate and so on. So if you want to specialise, if you want to do little modules, if you want to go on courses that aren't necessarily for specialising but little composite courses and things like that, just work out what are the things you're actually interested in, what would you like to try. Sometimes it's not the stuff you're interested in, it's the stuff that you feel you're not particularly good at and you want to get better at that. So um, I know a very, very well-known endodontist, and the reason she wants to do endo was because during VT she thought, well, actually, I'm, I feel I'm struggling with this. I was good at university, but I'm struggling with this now. Went to the Eastman, did the course, and now she's like an examiner for the MRD on endo. <laughs> so you never know where the route takes you. Um, personal life, marriage, family, where are you going to be in those five years? What are your circumstances? Um, who, who are you going to be with? Do you, is that for sure? Is that going to change? You don't know. Um, and financial achievements. Uh, in dentistry, sometimes we don't talk about money and how it imp impacts on our lives, but we need to bear in mind, do you want to own a home? I mean, it's hard enough as it is at the moment uh, for, for first-time buyers and so on. If you're wanting to put savings aside, if you want to buy a practice, um, if you want to think about your pension, you know, even your NHS pension, which I hear more and more people are opting out of, which I think is, is, is absolutely mad. You shouldn't be doing that. But, um, but read up more about that. Make sure you, you know what you're opting in and opting out for with anything to do with finances. Right, moving on. So my advice is experience, experience, experience in all different aspects. Um, you know, try and maybe move out if you're living with your parents, move out, try a different part of the country or a different aspect of dentistry. You want to become the independent adult you want to be. You don't want dentistry to hold you back from that. So remember to do that. Let's have a look. Uh, so going back to those, you can see that. Um, there are some topics that come to the forefront as you make the journey out into the world of work. Um, the pilots that are coming through with the new contracts being talked about. Um, there's direct access, which is looking at the role of hygienists and therapists, and whether they're able to set up on their own, whether they're able to see patients without having had an examination by a dentist. They have to make sure that they say to them, well, have you been to a dentist? You know you should go to a dentist, but they're able to carry on without necessarily dentists being involved. Um, tooth whitening, who can do it, who can't, what can you use? Um, and the NHS reforms that we were talking about as well. So things like the BDA website is quite good, and these links will be on the handout as well. So, and because it's a download one, you can just click on them and it'll take you straight to the page. So uh, get involved. That's the important thing. If there's a system that you're not happy with, if you're worried about it, I, I spent so much time complaining about how I thought things weren't great and how, how it could be done better. And I don't know if I made any changes, but I'm getting involved and slowly this, people are starting to hear the voices of younger, younger dentists and they need to know that they need to listen to us. Because also, the people coming to the end of their careers, we're kind of paying their pensions, you know, we're, we're looking after them as well. And in that respect, it's a symbiotic relationship. We've got to make sure that they listen to our concerns as well. Um, some, some people say, well, you've got to change everything, throw it all out and start again. But as some historians say, revolutions change some things, but they can be more destructive than productive. So there's some pathways in place. Try and use those if you can. Which neatly takes me on to the Young Dentist Committee, which I'm part of. Um, there are four main areas that we're looking at, and I stress that you guys get involved. Uh, one is the VT and DFT places. When I first was applying for VT, um, you apply to individual areas, you in apply to individual practices which some people thought was fantastic. For someone who's outside of London coming back to London, it felt a lot like a lot of the posts were sewn up. So people had been there at dental schools in London, they got to know the practices, they might have done some outreach, some of them were clinical demonstrators and so on. So there was, we felt it quite difficult to get back into London. Um, then I did my SHO job, because I applied and got SHO, but the VT posts were really tricky, even though I had quite a good CV and everything else. So then I thought, well, I'll do the hospital thing for a bit. And then the system changed, and they had the London Deanery uh, 
to go to the panel, submit the an application, and go through that way. The current system, I know a lot of you have gone through last year, sounds pretty stressful. Would you guys agree? Yeah. So it's teething problems, no pun intended, and, and things are changing and getting better. And I heard about things where people were informed that they hadn't got a post, but it was just before Christmas, and there wasn't any support network and things like that. So they're working on that, and the more you let us know what the issues are, then we can try and feed to the right, relevant sources. Career development, that's what we're looking at. If you want to be a general dentist, if you actually thought, I'm applying to, uh, to dental school to be the local dentist, to see my patients in the supermarket, and it's fine, I don't have a problem with that, rather than being a specialist, where do I go? How do I progress, rather than just sort of being on the treadmill? So career development, whether it's a specialist or is it a generalist, we want to support that. Role in practice, what's the role of the associate in the practice? Because before, you had that progression that someone could build up and buy the practice. Issues now with corporates or even getting loans or all these other things um, coming in, the role of therapists and associates and so on. So there's lots of issues that make us think, well, what is our role? Um, and one of the things I'd recommend definitely now is the way the system is moving, and this is kind of digressing a little bit with the new pilot, is that we're going to be looked at in three ways. You'll be a, a general dentist, so like who has sort of what we call the basic beginner standard dentistry. You can do most things. You have someone who's developed a bit of a special interest in something, uh, which means they can do more challenging cases, and then you've got the specialist. That's how the Jimmy Steele review and the, the future of NHS dentistry may be looking. So if you're having therapists coming in who can do those posts as well, and that blurring of that first position on the, on the ladder, where is, that, where is the therapist, where is the associate? A lot of people said with the pilots, the major concern they have is some of the practices on the pilots have turned around and said, well, we're going to have to downsize our dental workforce, our dentist workforce, should I say, and they've hired therapists as well. So that's one of the concerns that people feed back to us. There's two sides to the argument, and people say, well, it's about making the team more effective as well. But is anyone here involved with any pilot practices or no? Ask around. If you know anyone who is, find out what they're experiencing. I think the patients have turned around. They said their feedback's great. But the BDA is finding out more information about it. So do go and see what their consultation about it is. Um, and finally, leadership. We need young leaders to lead us forward in dentistry because otherwise people who don't really know what we're going through are making the decisions. So remember, you do have power. Um, every decision we make is a choice. Even if we do, don't do something, it's almost a choice to give up. Um, the next one, I was wondering whether I should even put this in, but I'm going to read this out. It's, it's quite heavy, and I'm not sure it's really that relevant to dentistry, but it's, it's from the Second World War, and they used to say this at Remembrance Assembly at school. Um, I'll read it out. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I wasn't, was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak up for me. And I think one of the things that is an issue in dentistry, I mean, I'm not comparing the Second World War to dentistry, but what I'm saying is, the society we live in, we all contribute to that immeasurably. And I think it's very, very important that within dentistry, we kind of, especially as young dentists, we work together because the medics can organize, they can get together and do lots of things. We haven't been as great at doing that. So there's always rivalries between dental schools and that kind of stuff, but sports days and stuff were always fantastic. BDSA conferences and stuff were great. And just remember that we're all going through the same stuff in different places, talk about it and work together on it, okay? Um, I call something dental happiness, and that's building the world around you that will make you happy in the pursuit of happiness. And I think in your first five years, you've got to be doing that. You've got to work out what's going to really make you happy. You don't be five years down the line and think, okay, now I want to think about where I want to be in the next 10 years, because you know it, time's going to start going. So uh, this nest, I mean, someone told me about this, and I thought it was a bit wishy-washy, wishy but we'll see. But why do you need a supportive network? Because... With tasks that we're not familiar with, we do more errors. Younger dentists make more errors as well in that respect. So with the litigious world we're in, complaints are up 34% was what I was hearing um, at a talk recently. But that's across the board, not just dentistry. So you've got the kind of ambulance chasers and various other firms and stuff trying to push this. And, but you've got to be aware of it and be prepared. Um, I'm going to tell you about my silicone mishap. We had a situation, um, I was taking an impression for a crown, I'd done a crown prep, I was about to take an impression. And you've got this, the light bodied and it's being passed to me, but the nurse hadn't put on the lid properly. So I squeeze it and all of this goes over the patient. And I was just thinking, oh God, what am I gonna do? So, uh, so I said, don't worry. Cause I thought to myself, oh, you know, well, it, you know, it wasn't my fault. She hadn't put on, I thought, and I was like, no, to be honest, it's done. I just don't want her to get more upset about this. So I said, it's fine. Just let me know how much the shirt is. We'll replace the shirt. Or actually, do you want 
just let me know about dry cleaning and this is what you should do and this is how we'll get out and so on and I'll pay for the dry cleaning. The patient then went and then just put it in a boil wash, which obviously didn't help, and then came back and said it has run. And I said, well, uh, I said, well, in that case, I'm happy to replace the shirt. Um, it was an M&S shirt and we saw on the website, my nurse looked it up, it was 25 pounds. And the patient said, it's, I think it's about 50 pounds. I was like, oh, fine, all right, it's 50 pounds. Um, and then I wrote a letter with a check enclosed and I said, here's the check, I'm really sorry that this happened. Um, um, funny enough, I saw your shirt online and it was 25 pounds <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry that you weren't able to follow the advice about how you should have really taken it to the dry cleaner, but don't worry about it, it's fine, it'll be okay. And in, in some ways, that was a couple of years in, and I think before that I would have panicked and been like, oh, what am I going to do? But my boss was like, just don't worry about it, it'll be okay. That supportive network gives you that confidence, and you remember your capabilities rather than your limitations and what you can do. So uh, at home, at work, you know, have that sort of respect with everyone that you interact. And that's how you can be a role model to society. So I love the fact that sometimes I walk down the street in, in my part of North London, and um, I bump into patients, and they'll be with someone they don't know, and they say, this is my dentist, he's very good, you know. I might not be, but they think I am. <laughs> and, and the key thing is because I show them respect when they come in. If, if they're stressed about something and like the kids are playing in the, in the waiting room and they're worried and all this kind of, and there's all this other stuff to do, I take that into account. So if they run late, I'm okay because sometimes I run late and they, they're understanding as well. Um, so just build up that kind of rapport and relationship. You know, don't see them as just people who come in and they're just getting a service out of you and going. You build up that relationship when you want to set up your own practice, when you want to buy a practice, those patients will follow you. And I've got patients that have followed me from every practice I've been at all around London. I've got patients who've moved out of London and still come down from the northeast to see me. So it's got, it works. And I'm not that great, but... Well, actually, I am. But, <laughs> but, but, but when it comes down to it, it's that relationship that makes people want to come. Uh, work it. Not on the dance floor, but just get your head down and work hard, you know? And even better, rather than just working hard, work smart. Don't, don't waste your time on things that don't really matter. Make sure every, every second really counts when, in your working day and in your planning, you know? You don't want to reinvent the wheel if someone else has already done some of the work. Expect the unexpected. I'm going to tell you... Uh, well, the MJDF one is quite simple. When I was doing MJDF, they said, you need to have it if you want to do any specialist training. And then at the talk yesterday, they were saying, we don't really need it. But I was like, oh, okay, well, that's, you know, a grand later. <laughs> that's the situation. So, um, and, and, it, and it happens, you know, it happens. So, um, anaphylaxis as a VT. So, uh, our, one of our nurses, uh, there's a very nice Chinese restaurant next door. And she always had prawns from there. And you can see where this is going. <laughs> so... But one day she came back and she started getting this rash and she, her voice started going a little bit. So it wasn't necessarily what you'd always imagine that would always happen. And then my boss at the time, he said, oh, it's fine, just take this inhaler and go home and if there's any problems, just we'll be fine. And I said, boss, I don't, think this is, <laughs> I don't think this is just an inhaler job. I think, so I took her along to, I think it was Mile End or Royal London, and they found out that she was having anaphylaxis. So expect the unexpected. Things don't always present as, as you might expect. Um, and uh, so, so that's one of the things that's interesting. Um, Oh, so I'm just going to go back one. Oh, there we go. And the something bad always happens. It was a practice in Hackney. If anyone knows, how many people know where Hackney is? There we go, yeah. Uh, it's a vibrant part of London. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, oh, the practice I was working at there, we've got a glass-fronted area, waiting room, reception, little broom cupboard, which is where I worked, and then sort of the, the next surgery behind and the surgery underneath, and then the staff room downstairs. Uh, I had a patient come in, a new patient, and they said, I'm really nervous. I said, okay, I heard this one, it's good, I can, I can deal with this. How, how come? She's like, well, every time I come to the dentist, something bad happens. And I thought, okay, right, batten down the hatches, we're gonna make sure nothing goes wrong here. She's in, so the patient's in the chair, we're doing the checkup, everything seems to be going fine. Um, and then I just see our receptionist pop her head in, and she says, uh, Dr. Vasani, can you just pop outside, there's a situation. And I said, uh, I'll be there in a minute. She was like, no, 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 you really need to come outside. So I walked outside, and there's this young chap, about 17 years old, lying on the floor. He's awake, uh, but our carpet has got a nice, it's got a nice little claret shade on the side. Basically, two gangs were fighting outside, and this guy just been stabbed in the arm. And he crawled into the practice. So him and his gang are inside. The other gang are outside. So it's glass fronted, so everyone can see. <laughs> uh, and, they're, and they're saying, oh, we're going to get you, we're going to get you, all this kind of stuff. So we've locked the door. Called the police. Luckily, we're near Homerton Hospital, so the, the ambulance was, was quite quick. And then we had to sort of filter all these patients downstairs. <laughs> and uh, so we, we patched the, the guy up, got him to his blood was uh, stopping, ambulance came in, police came in, everything was settled and so on. And then, so this, is, this took about an hour and a half. And I know we sometimes run late, you know, if you're surgery extraction, but an hour and a half is quite a lot, a lot of time. So then um, 
we get the patients back. And I just realized which patient was about to come back in the room. So, so she sits down in the chair and she said, see, I told you something goes wrong every time I come. <laughs> so you've really got to be, you know, expect the unexpected for sure. Um, now, uh, onto philosophy of dentistry. I mean, my philosophy of dentistry is quite simple. It's not those. Uh, in, it's even shorter than that, which is I treat everyone that gets in the chair like a member of my own family. And there are family members I don't necessarily like very much sometimes. But you still show them that kind of level of respect. You would do what you would do to someone you cared about. Um, and then that will build, help build that rapport that we were talking about. So um, do, do what you do for, for your family members. I mean, one of the things I say, there's, there's a phrase I always remember, that famous saying, it says, if I, but you've got to remember it's important for you as well. So the phrase was, if I'm not for myself, then who am I for? And if I'm only for myself, then what am I? So you've got to remember that you've got to do what's best for you as well, but you can't just be completely self-absorbed and, and so on. You've got to make sure that it works for everyone. And what you've got to do, do it well. You know, do it with professional. Don't just fling GIC from across the room into someone's, in, into someone's cavity. Um, and show professionalism with your, with your colleagues as well. You know, you've got to make sure that if... There's, there's another thing that I always remember, which is people who gossip with you will sometimes gossip about you. Um, and you've got to remember that. You know, if you keep those barriers and that professionalism, other people respect that as well, and they'll come through. Um, be confident, don't be arrogant because that's when big mishaps happen. You know? So just make sure you know what you're doing, but don't pretend you know, you're the be-all and end-all. And all of us who've done a really, really hard extraction that we thought we'd never get out and we get it out, I bet the next suit that comes in, we're all like, yeah, it's fine. You know, I, I basically, I'm an oral surgery consultant. And you go in and you snap the crown off, and then you're like, oh, okay, maybe I'm not. So, so you've got to be really, really careful with that. Um, and do it with pride. You know, a lot of people aspire to come and do dentistry in the UK. You know, um, be proud of where you've trained. Be proud of what you do, okay? Um, and finally, do it with hope, because you know, if you're just doing it thinking, do you know what, next year it's all going to go, just think of that there is a future to it, okay? Um, moving on, uh, a bit more advice, be prepared, be two steps ahead. Uh, I've worked, I worked out that I've worked with about 38 different nurses in the past period of time, which is quite, quite a turnover. Um, and some people are fantastic, and I, and I think about some of them as being better than some of the people I was at dental school with, because they can diagnose stuff while I'm still looking at the x-ray. Um, and others aren't fantastic. So be two steps ahead. So if it's some, I have one colleague I used to work with, and whenever we had a filling, uh, I would always have to ask for articulating paper. I would always have to ask for floss if it was like a, in the contacts and so on. And even though she knew how I worked, it was always <laughs> the same questions. I said, can you? But you just say two steps ahead, and you just got to do it that way. Um, later on, uh, yeah, yeah t that's another story for another lecture. So I'll, I'll tell you another one about that colleague. Um, Going on, um, pensions, we talked about direct access. We mentioned about the role of therapists and hygienists coming in. And is the associate a threat? We need to find out if that's the case, because we need to put our case forward. It might not be. It might be that it's actually the ideal symbiotic relationship to, to make the industry go forward. But we need to work out how it's going to come together. Um, and essentially, they're evolving their skills. They're doing more modules. We need to evolve, or we're just going to become you know, dinosaurs in this whole scheme. I'm going to give you some homework. <laughs> because I thought I'd use this. This is a, who, everyone knows who Rudyard Kipling is, right? Jungle Book, anyone? Right, so there's a poem called If, and I've actually printed it out, and I've stuck it on the wall of wherever I've worked. Um, and some of you might look it up on your phones and so on, but when you read through that, it'll probably read through like a bad day of being a dentist. <laughs> and then, but at the end, you just gotta keep, keep the strength, keep the faith, and keep going, okay? Uh, thank you for listening. Um, sometimes you gotta look at things from a different perspective. The handouts will be, on my website, uh, but they'll be on the DPL website as well. Um, what I'm going to do is, if people have questions, let me know and email me as well, because the handouts, I want to tailor it to what you guys want to know. So there might be questions that you're thinking, or you're thinking, and it's the same one, but no one's asked it. So ask the questions, and then I can make the handout as comprehensive as possible, so then on, after the weekend or so, you'll be able to download it and so on. It'll be a PDF form, so it shouldn't be that hard to get. Um, thank you for listening. <laughs>